morning. morning. If you would be willing to sing sing the opening hymn with us, please stand as we uh, sing O Day of Rest and Gladness 383. Good morning, everybody, and happy Sabbath. Glad you could join us here at the Sunnydale Church. Please remain standing, but let us bow our heads for our opening prayer. Dear Father God in heaven, we want to wish you a very happy Sabbath. Thank you for giving us this memorial of creation and redemption whom we have through Jesus Christ. We are here to celebrate our relationship with you, Father God, and so we thank you for giving us this day blessed since creation. We want to honor you, Lord Jesus, in remembering the great sacrifice you made for us and that you are our high priest in heaven interceding on our behalf here on this earth. And we are grateful for the promise of the Holy Spirit, whom you promised you would send to be with us and in us. And so we ask for the blessing and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to be in our hearts. Lord, today we have come to honor you. We have come to declare your worthiness. You are good and you are awesome. You are merciful. You are kind and you are loving. And we thank you for that. Lord, we want everything to be blessed by you, and so we ask that you would indeed bless the things so that you may be blessed. Thank you for those that have gathered here today, for those that are watching and listening. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We are delighted to have our listening guests here at the Sunnydale Church on 88.7 KSDQ Radio. Glad you could join us. We are here in Centralia, Missouri at the Sunnydale Seventh-day Adventist Church. If you're passing through and you still want to drop by, we'll be here for the next hour and a half. In fact, we'll be a little bit here, here longer because we have fellowship meal afterwards today. So if you have come and you are a guest here, um, we're not going to assume you came just for the food. Well, I got one chuckle. Okay, maybe two. Glad you could join us today. This is the Sunnydale Church. For those that are watching via YouTube on our streaming channel, glad you could join us. We hope to have you here in person. We would like to worship with you in person the Lord Jesus wants us to come together in person. Um, for those that are here in person, we are glad that you could join us today. You, do, you should have received a bulletin in hand. There are many announcements in there, different things that are happening and going on. So pay attention to details that are in there. What I like to typically do is just highlight some of the things that we'd like to invite your family and friends to. Um, 
Many of you know that Wednesday nights throughout the summer, we have Wednesday night activities night, and so we encourage you to come on out Wednesday nights. We're doing it through the month of July. Uh, activities begin at 6.30. We have things like uh, volleyball, uh, softball, t-ball, um, and uh, what other ball do we have? Kickball, that's right. Yes, very good. So we have kickball as well. And if you want to come for the snacks and the drinks, by all means, come, ahead, come and do that as well. We typically are out there for about an hour and a half or, or to two hours. And so uh, it'll be through the month of July. And so we encourage you to come on out and uh, bring who you would like to bring. Uh, also, there's a special bulletin insert regarding Vacation Bible School, Unlock the Treasure at VBS. It begins a week from tomorrow. So not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow on July 17th at 6 p.m. So give this bulletin insert to family and friends once you've read it, once you've programmed it in your phone, uh, send this out or give it to someone else and invite them to Vacation Bible School. Again, uh, the announcements are in the bulletin for those that are here. For those that are watching and listening, you can go to sunnydalechurch.org, 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 and you can go ahead and get the bulletin announcements there. And if you're the person that is watching that's stealing our numbers and prank calling us using the numbers on the bulletin, you're welcome to invite, you're, you're invited to church as well, and just let us know who you are. God bless. Thank you. I'll explain more later. It's for the world budget. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is known throughout the world for its mission outreach. And even before COVID-19, um, the Adventist Church was experiencing a decline in mission offerings. Now, part of that reason is that we get involved in our own local church and communities. We have specific projects we like to give to, and we see those results usually right away. The results of giving to the world budget might not be so visible this side of heaven because it's like adding drops of water to a river that we don't see. The offerings that we give for missions and the world budget affect people that on this earth we might probably won't ever meet and in places that we'll never go. But giving is very important because those people need what we have to share. Just as we don't know where every drop of water goes, we can see the beautiful river at the end. And in heaven, you will meet people that you have helped just by giving your offering. So, as the deacons stand and we have prayer, consider to giving liberally today to the world budget. Our dear God, thank you for the funds that we have and the ways that you provide for us. You have asked us to go into all the world. And we can't do that necessarily, but we can provide funds that will help. So please, as we give to support and sustain the work, we ask that you would bless it. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. One Sabbath, 12-year-old Ariel heard a sermon that really made him think. The pastor had said that everyone should be involved in missionary work. Ariel liked the idea of being a missionary, but what could a 12-year-old boy in Bolivia do? Ariel began to pray and ask God to help him be a missionary. He began to look for people who might be interested in learning about Jesus. As he looked, he kept praying. He didn't have to look far. 
One day, he went with his parents and sister to visit another family. While there, he learned that the family was interested in the Bible. He offered to give them Bible studies, and they agreed. Ariel had never given Bible studies before, so he wasn't really sure what to do, but he found a set of Bible lessons and studied them with the family. It wasn't easy, especially the last few lessons, but he prayed for God to help him. Ariel wanted to give more Bible studies, so he invited his classmate, Hébert, to study the Bible with him. Hébert looked forward to each new lesson. When they finished studying, Hébert decided to give his life to Jesus and was baptized. Ariel was so happy. God was helping him be a missionary. He remembered his original prayer to be a missionary and decided to continue praying to see what God wanted from him next. Ariel has found that he can be a missionary in many ways. He studies the Sabbath school lesson every day so he can learn more about God. Whenever he earns some money, he sets aside 10% to return to God as tithe and he also gladly gives some of the money as an offering. In everything that Ariel does, he wants to put God first. Even though Ariel is only 12, he has already led others to Jesus. No one is ever too young to be a missionary, he says. We can all be missionaries, sharing our love for God as we wait for him to take us to heaven. There is no Adventist church where Ariel lives. His family and others meet in one another's homes on Sabbath. It was in one of the church members' homes that Ariel heard the sermon that inspired him to become a missionary. Ariel's dream is for a church to open in his town one day. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help open a church near Ariel's town. Thank you for planning a generous offering so that more people can have a church where they can gather and share the good news that Jesus is coming soon. Pretty inspiring, isn't it? 12-year-old being a missionary for the Lord. How many of us are called to be missionaries? All of us, so it doesn't matter what age, right? Everybody is called to be a missionary. What an awesome, awesome story. Um, today's scripture reading is going to be found in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 24 and 25. That's 2 Kings chapter 6, 24 and 25. And it happened after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria. And indeed, they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and one-fourth of a cab of dove droppings for five shekels of silver. You going to be ready for this message today? Do you want to know why they were eating donkey's heads and bird droppings? Do you think it's going to happen here? Stay tuned for the message.
gifted people that inspire us to worship the Lord. Uh, at this time, it is uh, our opportunity to have the children come up for children's story. Uh, we'll be having uh, Jennifer Williams give the children's story today. And so, young ones, please head to the back, grab your baskets, and the offering you give today will be uh, helping to further Christian education. So give, give as the Lord permits. Inspires. want to come a little closer or sit on the floor I just want you to be able to see really well well hello happy Sabbath you guys so today I have a very special family here I'm not sure if you've met them their names are the bottle family have you met them no so first of all this is Papa Bottle. Oh. Next. Oh, we got to be careful with her. She's a little delicate. Next we have Mama Bottle. Isn't she beautiful? As she should be. There we go. All dressed nice and pretty. Next. Who do you think we have next? Brother, that's right. So we've got Papa, Mama, Brother. Hold on. Next we have Sister. There we go. She's a little fancier. And what do you think this one is? Baby Bottle. That's right. Now, do you guys know who the Holy Spirit is? You, do we all know we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, right? That's right. So in case you didn't know, the Holy Spirit has a wonderful job of helping you guys to understand things that you read in the Bible, understand things you hear in the sermon when the pastor's speaking, Sabbath school, things like that. He tugs on your heart and he says, don't take those cookies your mom told you not to. You know, that's the Holy Spirit because he wants you to he wants you to make good decisions. He wants you to understand things, right? Well, today I'm going to tell you a story about the Bottle family. And they were in church. And this right here is going to represent the Holy Spirit. Hold on. One second. It's not just any water. Okay. It's a little more special now the Holy Spirit's very special. So, the Holy Spirit was there in church, and he was visiting the Bottle family. 
and the pastor was speaking, and he had some fantastic sermons, as he always does. And he went over to Papa Bottle because he wanted to fill him up. But you know what happened? Papa Bottle was busy. He was thinking about the baseball game that day. He was like, man, I wonder who's, who's winning. So, oh, so he couldn't, the Holy Spirit couldn't fill him up. So he went to Mama Bottle. What do you think she was thinking about? She was thinking about that Sabbath lunch that was home staying warm in the oven. So the Holy Spirit couldn't fill her up. So then there was Brother Bottle. Holy Spirit went to the Brother Bottle. What do you think he was thinking about? What? You were right. He was thinking about Minecraft and all the cool levels, and nothing was being heard that the sermon about the sermon. Okay, so then we come to Sister Bottle. What do you think she was thinking about? Her hair. Uh-huh. Her phone. She was thinking about Billy Bob and her date later that night, and she was so excited because he brought her flowers, and he was so cute. So the Holy Spirit was not able to fill her up either. What do you think Baby Bottle was thinking about? That's right. Little Baby Bottle was listening. And the Holy Spirit was able to fill up the baby bottle. Right? So you guys, when you sit out there, you might be surprised what lessons you can learn from listening to the sermon. And the Holy Spirit will help you to understand them. They're very valuable. It's very special to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Would anybody like to have prayer? Nora, you want to come up here? Dear Jesus, thank you for today. Please help for us to have a wonderful day. And please help that um, Jesus comes back soon. And please help for us to sleep good tonight and get ready for us to take on the day. And Jesus, stay. Amen. morning again. Now it's time for us all to sing together. We're going to start with showers of blessings and looking forward to you singing with us. Makes me think of camp meeting, makes me think of the weather and that we just had some rain. Please join us. Let's stand for the first song.
but we're also going to um, talk a little bit about camp meetings. Do you remember the camp meetings of old? Like Michigan Camp Meeting is where I'm, that's where I'm from and I grew up. And it was a 10, 10 day time. We always took our vacation on that week. My mom did and my aunt and my cousin. And we would be there all 10 days. What do you remember about camp meeting? It, it's the worst rainstorm is experienced that week and the hottest sunshine. And here you are burning up in the tent or in your camper. But anyway, it was always so wonderful and the blessings were amazing. Let's sing about sunshine in our soul. There's sunshine in my soul today. Sometimes we attach songs with people. And sometimes it's based on the person that kind of brought it into our singing time together. And that's why Kevin, <laughs> I literally just asked him a few minutes ago to join us because he was the one I think that brought this into our into our praise time. And it's just a wonderful addition and we love it. And I'm so glad he said yes to join us singing Step into the sunshine. Step into the sunshine. Get out of the shade. This is the one time that you've got it made. And you can feel yourself smiling. Way down to your shoes. Step in. Find the great good news. Thank you. 
of the scriptures and do some reading. And the Lord led me across the uh, pages of Matthew here this last week. And the description of the Sermon on the Mount is so wonderful. I love that version. But Jesus distinctly tells the people, don't worry so much. Don't worry about the things that the rest of the world's worrying about. I know what you have need of, and I'll take care of you. Now, we'll read that, and it sounds good for about the first five minutes, and then we go back to worrying about everything else the world worries about. I'm tired of that. I don't know about you folks. I am tired of worrying about what the world worries about. I want to enjoy the peace that God offers. And I don't know why it's so hard to trust him. But this little song, it kind of says it all. Lord, I want to cast all of my cares upon you. And so if I'm going to trust you, you're going to have to give me that kind of trust. You're going to have to give me that kind of faith. You're going to have to give me that kind of peace because it's not within me to create this. If it is, it'll never happen. And I'll continue being the same. But the good news is the plan of salvation is a plan where God takes broken people like you and I. And he teaches us how to trust. And he teaches us how to rest. And he teaches us how to cast our cares upon him. So this morning, we're going to sing this song one more time. And wherever you find yourself, whether you're right here in the congregation this morning, listening on the radio, perhaps watching live stream. I encourage you, as we sing these words, make it personal, bring it home to the heart, may it be your desire this morning, we cast our cares upon him, if you'd like to bring your cares to the, uh, to the front this morning as we sing this last verse, we'd invite you to do that. Congregation, would you, as far as possible, please kneel together as we pray this morning.
Wars can be terrible for supply chains. There can be disruptions, shortages, all kinds of challenges. The biggest example is oil. We've been seeing that. At the first sign of war, oil prices begin to rise. But in Ukraine, it is not just oil. Many more commodities are at stake, especially these three, wheat, sugar, and cooking oil. Let's start with the numbers. Russia is the largest exporter of wheat. They make up 18% of global exports. Ukraine is the fifth largest, making up 7% of global sales. Put together, that's 25%. What happens if this supply chain is disrupted? Shortages? and inflation. That's what happens. Ukraine has already banned the export of food grains. Frankly, there are no other option. Ukraine's exports go through the Black Sea, specifically via three ports, Odessa, Kherson, and Mykolaiv. All three ports are on Russia's radar. Moscow, too, has announced a partial ban. They have temporarily stopped exports to ex-Soviet states. Imagine 25% of the global supply disappearing overnight. Naturally, there will be consequences. Which countries will be the worst hit? Let me show you this list. Egypt is the biggest wheat importer in the world. Turkey is second. Bangladesh is third. Next comes Nigeria, Yemen, Azerbaijan, and the Sudan. Also on this list are Libya, Lebanon, and Tunisia. Do you see the trend? Wheat is not imported by affluent powers. It is bought by the developing world. And if there is a supply gap, these countries will suffer. The United Nations is making grim predictions. It says food prices could surge by up to 22%. You could say it's the perfect storm. First climate change, then the Wuhan virus, and now war. Look at the numbers since 2020. Wheat prices are up 33%. Sunflower oil prices up 60%. If the war drags on, things could get worse. Is there any way to contain this rise? Well, other producers could step up. Countries like the US, Canada, and France. But protectionism is a problem. You see, prices are rising everywhere, not just in Ukraine or Russia. So every country is guarding its food reserves, basically saving up for the future. The second vulnerable commodity is cooking oil. Again, let's begin with the numbers. Russia and Ukraine lead sunflower oil production. Together, they make up 75% of the exports. 75%. It's almost like a monopoly. The good news is there is no export ban. Russia and Ukraine still export sunflower oil. The bad news is productivity is down, and you can imagine why. More than 3 million people have fled Ukraine. Their cities are being pounded by missiles. Obviously, agriculture is not their top priority at the moment. For India, this could be a huge blow. 90% of India's sunflower oil comes from Russia and Ukraine. Since the invasion, that supply has fallen. The result is this. Sunflower oil prices have surged 32 ru rupees per litre in India. Will this be a long-term problem? The government of India says no, it won't be a problem. Sunflower oil makes up just 10% of India's edible oil consumption. The rest is palm oil and soybean oil. So in the long run, India has two options. Diversify purchases, that is start buying sunflower oil from elsewhere, or shift to other edible oils. And like I said, this is a long-term solution. Diversification does not happen overnight. Neither will consumers change their cooking preferences. And remember, edible oils have a chain effect. Restaurants use it. Bakers use it. Instant food companies use it. So the effect will be felt down the supply chain. The third vulnerable commodity is sugar. Compared to last year, sugar prices are up 20% already. Now, Ukraine and Russia are not leading producers, but the war is fueling uncertainty. And that uncertainty is increasing prices. By the way, these commodities are not luxuries. They're staple goods, wheat, oil, sugar, staple. They're part of every humanitarian aid shipment too. They top every family's grocery list. The developed world will not mind these shortages. They're imposing export curbs. They're protecting their reserves. But what about countries like Yemen and Libya? They depend on aid shipments. Without imports, they will plunge into starvation. That is the reality of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The people of Yemen have nothing to do with Ukraine. Neither do the people of Libya or the Sudan or Nigeria. But their daily meals will become more expensive thanks to Vladimir Putin. That is, if there is a meal at all. Vion is now available. morning once again. <clears throat> for those that are joining us today, uh, for the first time, we're in the middle of a series here entitled Global Forecast. Today's part four, preparing for the coming food shortage. 
The idea here is to hopefully encourage us in the Lord as we move forward. What are the basic necessities of life? What do they say? Three things, right? Food, shelter, clothing, right? What's going on with the housing issue? Is there a surplus or is there a shortage? They tell us there's a shortage. This is what we hear. If there's people in real estate or building, I know that they are here as well. They tell us there's a shortage of housing. For those that are farmers here, I'm going to ask you some questions. I want your participation in the sermon. This may or may not be an unconventional sermon, but for those that have been around for quite some time, I'm unconventional. That's the goal. Hopefully, we're going to think differently. Hopefully, we're going to pray differently. Hopefully, we're going to see things differently as a result of this series here and especially this message today. Next time we meet, we're going to be covering Global Forecast Part 5, Solving the Coming Food Shortage. Today is preparing for the coming food shortage. Next time we meet, it's going to be solving the coming food shortage. So how is this going to happen? Is this new to everybody, the food shortage? Have you guys heard about this? If you guys have heard about this, this is not something new. The question is, is there really a shortage? That's my question. What's the motive here? What's the motive here? Here's one news article. It says it this way. United Nations says billions facing food insecurity levels. The world is moving backwards. This is just a couple of days ago, July 7th. It says here more than 2 billion people globally are facing moderate or severe difficulty obtaining enough to eat. Is that true? Okay. So what's the solution? What is the solution? The next article from the Modern Farmer says this way. California wants to pay farmers not to farm this year. So if there's a food shortage, the solution is to pay farmers not to farm. If there's a food shortage, here's the solution. We're going to pay farmers not to farm, according to here. How does this make sense? It does make sense if you're thinking like they do. You're translating in Korean? Okay, this is cool. All right. I've had Spanish translators, but never in Korean. This is very, tell them I said this is very nice. Angela Choi's parents are here, and she's translating in Korean. We are glad that they are here. So the state of California is taking extreme measures to conserve water. If this is contrary to what you know, you can correct me up front. I will voice it through the microphone so that our YouTube watchers and those that are listening would hear it as well. This year, California farmers have been given a financial incentive to not plant crops. California produces virtually all of domestically grown sushi rice. Tell them that one. They're from California, correct? No, they're not. They are from, but they visited in California first, right? Philadelphia. Who's in California? Your parent, that's what it is. Okay, all right. California produces virtually all of the domestically grown sushi rice, and the Central Valley is responsible for a quarter of the nation's crops. 25% of what you eat is from California. And they're telling the farmers, don't farm. In fact, we'll pay you not to farm. For those that are farmers, am I, is this correct, Dennis? Is that what you're hearing? Yes, no, maybe so. He's like, yes, that's your bro. Right? We have farming and we have housing here. Is that what you're hearing about the housing market? Not enough? Larry? Linda? You hear all kinds of things. And that's another side point. Who do you trust with the information coming through? This is just one side of the story of food. Some say there is no shortage. There's not going to be a shortage. We've heard from our country leaders saying, look, prepare for a shortage. And I've said this before. There's a couple of different ways you can have a shortage. One is to not have the farmers work. Number two is to say that there's going to be a shortage. And then what do people do when they go to the grocery store? They'll stock up. They'll start hoarding. And I'll say artificially create a food shortage. 
This was the world leader, Henry Kissinger. I've shared this before. He says it this way. He was the 56th U.S. Secretary of State. Who controls the food supply controls the people. Who controls the food supply controls the people. This is a head of state. This is how these people think. Who controls the energy can control continents. Who controls money controls the world. You want to know what the motivation is for Ukraine and Russia? There's multiple out there. Could this be one of them? Before, it was COVID. And we blame COVID for everything, right? No one ever named their kid COVID. Just like no one ever named their kid Judas or Jezebel. No one ever named their kid COVID. It's so bad that way. And so here, now we have war in Russia and Ukraine, and they get the blame for the supply chain issue. Is that what's going on? Is that the reason for the war? I'm not going to say for sure. There's other things going on, and world politics is tricky. So stay tuned for the message today. Is the solution, how do we uh, prepare for the coming shortage? Should we go to the grocery store and hoard as much food as we can now? Well, that's what they did for COVID. What did they do? What did they go for COVID for when they went to the grocery stores? I don't understand that. Can someone explain that to me? My parents are immigrants. I was born under an immigrant household. I don't understand this. Why is it that paper products were being hoarded? I don't understand. How many, I mean, are you going to go to the bathroom more times? Because, I, honest, is that true? I don't understand it, okay? I thought maybe it was just a foreigner thing. But even the, the local Americans don't understand that either. Country folk, you folk are country folk. It's all the sheep, right? Operating on scarcity, decrease the amount of goods and you're controlled. Is there enough food to feed the world population of 7.5 billion people? There is. I believe God can feed His people. I truly believe that. Then why do we see hunger and starvation in some parts of the world? We'll get to our message today. Why do we see starvation, those pictures of the emaciated people in different parts of the world? Why does that happen that people are hungry and they're starving? They don't have their basic necessities. They don't have the wheat. Say that again? To control the people. Because here's what happened. In these underdeveloped, you want to call them underdeveloped countries, how do the heads of their countries live? They live very well. They are very well fed. So you know it's there to make the people suffer. We're going to be talking about sanctions in just a few moments because that happened to God's people in the Word of God, and that's where we're getting to. Whether it's government-induced shortage or, or of supplies or simply a mismanage of goods, people are beginning to say, that there's going to be a shortage of food in the coming season. My thing is, okay, if we know that there's a, we forecasted a coming food shortage, why don't we plant more or do something different instead of incentivizing farmers to do less? That would be the logical thing, correct? Don't pay farmers not to farm. Should our focus be on hoarding? No, we talked about that. Sure, should our focus be be on self-preservation, seeking to do what we can to preserve ourself. Is that the Christian ideal? Preserving ourself? What should we be focusing on? Others, the saving of souls. In all governments, in all economic climates, we should be focusing on telling the people that Jesus is coming soon and the truth of the gospel as it is in His Word. We should not be styling up taking all of our energies on stockpiling, on hoarding, but in soul saving. So does that mean we shouldn't do our own gardening and try to do what we can? No. But our focus should be on the people. We're doing more in gardening at our household, and some of you are as well. I'm looking forward to having some of the things from your garden. That's okay to say that, right? right I hope. I, I said it anyway. So today's message is going to focus on an apparently, an apparently hopeless situation with God's people. But in the end, God's people are rescued. 
Do we face hopeless situations in the future? Stay tuned. Some would say they are hopeless, but only time will tell. We shall see. We're going to turn to the book of 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 24. Again, preparing for the coming food shortage. This is Global Forecasts Part 4. We're going to be at chapter 6. If you'd like to follow along in your Bible, we're going to be 2 Kings chapter 6. The Bible verses will be up here as well. And it happened after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Suriya, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria. And indeed, they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and one-fourth of a qab of dove droppings for five shekels of silver. <coughs> this was during Scripture reading, and we talked about this. Now, Syria... Back then in the Bible is a nation that's not God's people. They are surrounding, they're to the north and to the east of God's people, Israel, in the land of Canaan. Samaria became the capital of Israel after the country was divided into two parts, north and south. After King Solomon, after his reign of 40 years, the kingdom was divided into two. There was the northern kingdom which retained the name Israel. Then there was a southern kingdom which kept the name Judah, or had the name Judah, and Jerusalem was in the southern kingdom. Now, in the southern kingdom of Judah, they had good kings and bad kings. However, in the northern kingdom of Israel, there was only bad kings. By bad, I mean they did not recognize the Lord God as their supreme uh, commander and ruler. They actually forsook their Lord and went into idol worship continuously. And so you have here um, Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom. And you have the Syrian army that besieged the city. They cut off the food supplies. Now, why would an army cut off food supplies? To control the people, right? To starve the people, to get them to submission, right? What do we call that today when you cut off food supplies from countries? We call that sanctions, economic sanctions. Very popular these days, economic sanctions. By the way, in case you're wondering, the Bible says that there's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. Starve the people into submission. If they die, that's fine. They die. And so we have the same things going on in the world climate, in world economics. Sanctions. For what reason? I don't really, I don't want to say I don't care about how you feel about Ukraine and Russia. But know that wars are planned by even powers that are greater than the heads of state as you, as you and I know them. Babylon controls these situations. And it's a chess piece to come after eventually God's people. Stay tuned. Yes, indeed, there are sanctions placed upon God's people. And the sanctions, as we talked about earlier, do they affect the leaders? Who do they affect the most? They affect the people. My parents' home country of Iraq, during the 90s, there was economic sanctions placed against Iraq. We have, and we had relatives there. And my mom was so agitated and irritated. She said, my family is starving over there because of sanctions placed upon them for what the leaders want to do. The leaders are high and mighty. The leaders are gaining weight, and they look plump, and they have red in the face. But our family was starving overseas. Could it happen here? Why not? Why not? We are living in very interesting times. In fact, just so you guys know, if you haven't read the last book in the Bible, it's chapter 13, there's going to be a group of people who will not be able to buy and sell. There'll be sanctions placed upon them, those that are faithful to God, those that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is what's happening. The things that are happening today are to prepare us for what is to happen in a larger scale and to God's very own people. I hope we would take time regularly with God to build our faith in Him on a regular basis. The situation is so bad, it is so desperate, what were they eating? Donkey head and dove droppings, right? Join us for a fellowship meal today, right after worship service. We're not having that, by the way. Bad, so right? How do you translate that one, Angela, in Chinese? Or, I'm sorry, Korean. Korean. Right? Ouch. Yeah, make sure you say... 
that when I've invited them to a fellowship meal, to let them we are not, we're not having dove droppings and donkey heads. But this is how bad it got. Would you be able to eat this? Why not? If you were desperate, what would you do? Would you do this? Are God's, are God's people supposed to be eating this? In fact, notice this if you look at it up there. They were buying it for 80 shekels of silver. Is that a small or is that a lot? That's a lot. So there's scarcity of food. They ate all the wheat. They ate as much grain as possible, barley, as much as they could. But eventually it got so bad that they were buying a donkey's head, which donkeys are beasts of burden, for 80 shekels of silver. You're eating the livestock. This is donkey, by the way, donkey, the Bible says, is not a food. It's not for you and I to eat, just like other animals. Dove droppings. How many of you guys have seen what dove droppings look like? Right? You know, you think I'm making light of this? They ate this and they had potluck with it. This is all they had. It's like queso sauce, right? Drizzle it on the donkey head. We laugh. This is what they're doing. They are that desperate for food, but it gets worse. If you've read the story, these are one of these stories where you say, that's in there? If you've never read it, or you say, oh yeah, that's right. This is God's people being besieged. There's a reason why they were being sieged or besieged by the Syrian army. There was a famine in the promised land. Was there supposed to be a famine in the promised land? No. So what's the issue? Is, it, is the Syrian army too big for God? Then what's the issue? What's wrong with the people? Right? They didn't return to God. They're, they're worshiping idols. They're doing everything ungodly. Not perfect. They're far from perfect. It's not like they had interpersonal struggles. Maybe they did as well. But this is a whole nation or the northern king that turned away from God. Would you eat those things if things got desperate? Would you eat a donkey head? Would you drizzle those dove droppings? Would you do that? Is there another way? There is another way. Donkey's not a food, but they barbecued it. It's true. This was a desperate situation as it appears, but without a remedy. This was the promised land, and there was a famine in the promised land. Let's see what happens next, because it's going to get worse. Verse 26. <clears throat> then as the king of Israel was passing on the wall, <clears throat> a woman cried out to him, saying, Help, my lord, O king. Verse 27. And he said, If the Lord does not help you, where can I find help for you? From the flesh tre threshing floor or from the wine press? Then the king said to her, What is troubling you? And she answered, This woman said to me, Give your son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And I said to her on the next day, Give your son that we may eat him but she has hidden her son. It went from bad to worse. How many sons do you have? Two. Okay. Where did she go? I was going to, okay. Where did Nikki go? All right. She had a son as well. Has a son. <clears throat> Who does the woman cry out to? She cries out to the king. The woman doesn't cry out for the heavenly God. She calls on the earthly God for help. Can the king give her what she needs? No. Here's humanity's mindset. Hopefully this is not our mindset here. Humanity's mindset is, man can fix my problem. Man can fix my problem. I'm going to say it this way. Humanity thinks that the very ones that 
cause the problem is going to be asked to fix the problem. It's like politics today. I didn't make the decisions over in our country's capital to go in debt trillions of dollars. If your family operated this way, could it survive? No. It doesn't matter what side of the political spectrum you're at. It's always the same thing. This is the problem. This is the problem. This is the problem. But guess what? I have the solution. And I haven't lived as many years as many of you have. And as I am looking, there hasn't been a solution yet. What is the solution? Can man fix the problems? No. Would you give your son to be eaten? You wouldn't? They did. Look at how he answers in verse 27. He said, if the Lord does not help you, where can I, help? Where can I find help for you? The truest statement he said, if the Lord can't help you, I can't help you, lady. Then he says, where am I going to get the food from? The threshing floor? Where am I going to get the food from? The wine press? You see there's no rain. You see we've been besieged. There is no wheat. I can't get you any food, lady. Nothing in her pantry. Nothing in her refrigerator. There's nothing happening here. Dire circumstances. Life and death situations. How many of us are going to eat this afternoon? Not donkey head and bird dropping. We are going to eat this afternoon, aren't we? And we're going to have a good time eating. I've seen how... How you guys eat. You guys, you eat with all your heartiness. Hey, the wisest man never said, said, eat and drink and be merry. Right? But if that's all our focus, then that's a problem. There are focus of, is that true? If that's only our focus is eating and, and drinking, I'm not talking about things we shouldn't be drinking, but if that's all we do is eat and drink and that's about life, we've missed the point of life. It's nice to eat and drink. I enjoy it. I enjoy when you guys make food and invite me over and have meals together. This is a situation here. Lady, you see that there's nothing growing and a foreign army is preventing any food from coming to all of you. Does that sound familiar? Where am I going to get food for you? Maybe if I tell you, lady, just keep a positive attitude, right? That's going to feed your family, right? Keep a positive attitude. Should we have a positive attitude, though? If we know who's in charge, if we have that relationship, we should have that attitude. Keep your head up. But that doesn't fix the situation unless it's focused on the true hope. And that's Jesus. So the king says, you're asking me for help and I can't help you. The king admits it. Lady, I can't do it. The truest statement he ever made. You're asking me to do the impossible and I am not capable of that. There is no food. It goes from bad to worse. In fact, she's not. What is she complaining about? Is she complaining about eating her son? She's complaining that, look, we ate my son yesterday, and I can't get, I don't have a chance to eat her son. She's missing out on a meal, it's someone else's kid. She's not complaining, I don't have any food. This is what she told the king. Not that there's no food. She won't give me her son to eat. We ate mine yesterday. How bad could it get for God's people? This was supposed to be the promised land. And by the way, what needs to happen to a human before you eat them? You have to take their life. Think about that horror. You have to take the life of your own kid to eat them. I cannot stomach that. I would rather die myself. Now that you guys know that none of you are appealing to me, we were on good terms, right? You guys look good, but not that good. This is a disgusting story. This is one of those stories. How many guys remember this story? You guys did? Good for you. You guys remember how it turned out? We'll get to that next time we meet. Look at the depravity of God's people at this time. Breaking the sixth commandment. They are saying, let's eat your son if it, as it was a casual conversation. What are you guys having for dinner tomorrow? Oh, you should see him. 
He's a delight. He's a joy. An innocent child died because of the actions of others. The issue was not that there was nothing to eat. The issue was that she is not giving her son so that I could eat it. This child was a male child. Especially in those days, what's the purpose of having a male child? What would, what would the male child do for the family? Land, inheritance, right? Carry on the name. They're eating their future. They're eating the inheritor of their land and their property. She's not going to have a future. It goes from bad to worse to worser. It doesn't translate in Korean? Okay. Super, the worstest. The worst. There are some desperate situations that are not of our doing, right? Sometimes we could be doing the right thing, the best we can for our families, but calamity happens. This famine issue was not because they were doing the right thing. It was because for generations they had rejected God, and so God backed off. He says, if you want to have it your way, this is what's going to happen. Willful disobedience for generations. It's not the occasional misdeed that you and I engage in. You could do the right things and calamity can happen. They sought for an earthly king to satisfy them, but they did not search for the king of kings. Now, where in the Bible have we seen two women coming before a king to decide the fate of a child before? King Solomon. Did King Solomon make the right decision? Why did King Solomon make the right decision? Because he had wisdom from who? From God. He had that connection. He had that relationship. This king could not make the right decision. He could not even say, lady, you shouldn't be eating your kid. God will provide. He could not say that. You shouldn't be eating that donkey head and the bird droppings. This woman is upset that the other woman reneged on the deal. Pretty horrific. Continuing on in the story. Now what happened when the king heard the words of the woman? That he tore his clothes, and as he passed by on the wall, the people looked, and there underneath he had sackcloth on his body. Then he said, God do so to me and more also, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on him today. At this point, the king's doom in his country is imminent. A nation has besieged them and is starving them out of existence, and so what is the king to do? The king is hopeless. And worse yet, the hopeless woman is asking a hopeless king for help. The king is wearing sackcloth and ashes, or sackcloth. What does sackcloth mean? What does it mean when someone puts on sackcloth? They're mourning. What do you think he was mourning of? His own sin of his country or that they couldn't eat? The consequences rather than the sin itself. Right? Many times we mourn the consequences of our decisions, but not the issue at heart that we have a corrupt heart and we have chosen not God. How many of us have done that in our lives where we, even in our Christian walk, where we've chosen not God before? Maybe time and time again. Yep, you're in good company if you feel that way because all of us are there. Was he sincerely sorrowful about the situation? I believe it was an outward appearance. There may be some tinge of, look what we've done here. But if he was truly mourning in his heart, he would not have sought the head of Elisha. Does that make sense? Elisha was the prophet at that time, the leading prophet. And he blames Elisha. So if he blames Elisha, who is he really blaming? He's blaming God. He was sorry for the situation, but not sorry for the actions of the country and his actions that contributed to this calamity. Righteous Elisha was blamed for the calamity. And that's how it's going to be as we get closer to the end of time. Those who stand up for God and His truth and His word, the truth of the gospel all the way through, they will be looked at as the cause of all the calamity and the war and the strife in the world. It's their fault why there's earthquakes and famine and disease and pestilence. It's this group over here. It's their fault over there. So the, what we need to do is we need to eliminate them. Just like the king wants to do to Elisha, the king wants to eliminate Righteous, Elisha. Let's 
moving forward. Look what Elisha is doing in verse 32. But Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him. And the king sent a man ahead of him. But before the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, Do you see how this son of a murderer has sent someone to take my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door. I'm sorry, shut the door and hold him fast at the door. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? And while he was still talking with him, there was the messenger coming down to him. And then the king said, Surely this calamity is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Then Elisha said, this is chapter 7 and verse 1, Then Elisha said, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow about this time, a seah of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel, and two seahs of barley for a shekel, at the gate of Samaria. So an offer, officer on whose hand the king leaned, answered the man of God and said, Look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could this thing be? And he said, that is Elisha, in fact, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. The king blames the prophet for this calamity. It wasn't the prophet's fault, but do we do that? Do we blame others for situations in our lives? And all the, all, all the while, it's our own choices that got us there? Yes, things haven't changed in the Bible. Human nature is still the same. Many times we want to blame someone else for the result of our wrongdoing, whether it's a child, a spouse, an employer, a coworker, a fellow church member, a church leader. Why do we like to blame others? Why did the king want to blame Elisha? Why? Why did he say, you know what, I screwed up this whole time. Why do people want to blame other people? Who wants to answer that one? They don't want to admit it's their fault because if you admit it's your fault, what do you, that's personal accountability, isn't it? Introspection. We have to take an evaluation and say, look, what am I doing wrong here, Lord? That's what I try to do every time. What did I do wrong here? By the way, this is marital counseling. For some of you, premarital counseling. First, ask yourself this question. Self. Now the king blames God in verse 33. If this issue is from God, why should I wait for Him? That's what the king is saying. If this issue is from the Lord, why am I going to wait for Him? Why am I going to continue to be loyal to Him? For those that are going through the adult Sabbath school quarterly, talking about the crucible in Christ, the things, the affliction that come into our lives as Christians in our lives, and how do we get through it? Great Sabbath school quarterly, I would encourage you to spend some time daily in there. He wants to execute the prophet. The king doesn't want to admit it was a nation's disobedience that caused God to remove his protection from them. And so the prophet makes a promise to the messenger. He says, you know what? Food will be sold tomorrow. There is a rescue. I know the God who's in charge, and you're going to be eating tomorrow. You just wait. But guess what? You don't believe it, so you're not going to have any of it. It's going to happen. There is desperate circumstances. There is no crop. There is no food. There is no pantry. No food in the refrigerator. There is no turkey bacon from Prangers that you got on sale. It's done. And so he asked this question, could food come down from heaven? Yes, it can. God can and God will provide for his faithful people. Notice what it says here. This was perfect what you did for music, Kurt. You didn't know this. Matthew 6.25 through, 6, through 33. This is some Bible promises that you can take with you as we close. Jesus is speaking here. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. How many of you are worried about your life? Really? Nobody raised their hand? You always respond. Thank you, Mr. Aiden. Thank you. Don't worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body. Are you tired of hearing people complain about everything? Then you stop complaining. Stop complaining about complaining people. (coughs) 
Don't worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. Can someone say inflation? Do the birds recognize inflation? But us, understanding human beings, we recognize inflation. Look at birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? By the way, food, clothing, and shelter, those are the necessities, right? If, food is short, if there's a sh- shortage in food and a shortage in housing, what's next? Clothes. I'd admit, I'd, I wasn't trying to make anybody blush, but is that the next shortage? Shortage in clothing? Where do we get most of our clothing? I'll say it this way, economically. Is it here in the States? No, it's overseas. So how about the supply chain management there? Bring your bed sheets next week. It's Togo week at church. That's what they did in Bible times. Is that where we're headed? You guys think I'm making light of this, and there's some hearty things there, but think about where this could go. Notice what he's telling them here. This is even God's own people, as we are called to be. The birds do not labor or spin, yet I tell you not even Solomon. In all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will not he, will he not much more clothe you of little faith? You're here today because you have faith. God wants to grow our faith. God wants us to be less attached to the world and more attached to Him. And I'm growing with you there. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear for the pagans run after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. What are we called to seek? Seek God first and His righteousness. Seek the kingdom and His righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Seek God first. Seek God first. Notice this. This is from the book Desire of Ages. I'm going to close here. It says here, remember this. This is from Desire of Ages, page 330. Our Heavenly Father has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing. How many different ways does God have to provide for us? At least a thousand. To provide for us of which we know not anything. Those who accept the one principle of making the service and honor of God supreme will find perplexities vanish and a plain path before their feet. Those who accept the one principle of making the service and honor of God supreme will find perplexities vanish and a plain path before their feet. Are you worried about the food crisis? You shouldn't be. We should be aware of it. We should do what we can. God's in control. We do our part. And God will do His. Is there a situation, an impossible situation going on in your life? Do what we are called to do. and That is be faithful to Him. Even in your imperfect life. God is the only one that's able to offer true hope. And so today I ask you this question. Do you guys want to see how the story ends? We'll continue reading this afternoon if you'd like to see how it ends. But if you're not going to read it, next time we meet, we're going to talk about solving the coming food shortage. How how does God solve this shortage? What I want to do now is end with a word of prayer. For those who are asleep already, just stay there with your head nodded. Father God in heaven, we are grateful that our lives are in your hand. Thank you for giving us the promises in your word. Thank you for giving us the stories that encourage our faith even during tumultuous times. Yes, indeed, it got so bad that eventually they began to eat their own children. This is disgusting, and I cannot fathom it. But this is what happens to a world or to a nation here with no hope. Lord, we do have hope in you. 
We know that you are able to provide. It is nothing for you to provide food, clothing, and shelter for us. Lord, help our motives to be right. Help us to put you first in all that we do. We are grateful that you've given us the promises in your word that we should not worry about food, clothing, and shelter, but that our concern is your concern, and that is the souls that you have paid an eternal price for. Thank you that the global forecast truly is that you are coming soon and that the gospel will go out to the entire world before your return. Thank you, Lord, for giving us that global forecast that we can bank on. Bless the remainder of our afternoon, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.